The Tudor flat cap. From knitted knockoff to required by law. What are they and how are they made? Come find out with me. In 1571, Elizabeth I issued the Cappers Act, which required every man under over the age of six to wear a knitted cap unless they were of a high enough rank. But that's not where the story of these caps start. By 1512, caps were regulated both by set price of what could be charged for them and materials that could go into them. And they seem to be at that time replacing medieval hoods as the head covering of choice for men. Tudor bonnets made from silk velvet were popular among fashionable young men during Henry VIII's reign. The knitted version became popular among professionals and artisans as a cheaper version as well as a version they were allowed to wear by sumptuary laws which which restricted what styles and materials people were allowed to wear based on their position in society. By 1571 in the Cappers Act, the English wool trade was dying and the act was intended to bolster that trade by requiring people in England to purchase caps and wear caps made of English wool. It just so happened that these tended to be flat caps because those are what people wore at the time. These caps are a couple of different types. There's brimless, single brim, split brim, and half brim. All of which describe the type of brims. The Each of these styles resembles in general shape and appearance a modern beret with a round flat circular top and then all of the brimmed versions have a extra brim underneath that fl the flat circular top that is made of a double layer of knitted fabric. Also like a modern beret, after these caps are knit, they are fulled to create a tight, dense, warm, waterproof fabric, and then they have a nap raised on top, which is what creates the appearance of a velvet fabric instead of a knitted fabric. Unfortunately, no records from the time exist that detail how these caps were made, although the 1571 Act does list 14 different processes or steps. Which is interesting because it indicates that these caps were not made in home for the family by people in the family. They were made by professionals to be sold and even were exported all over Europe. The professional processes that the 1571 Cappers Act list are carters, knitters, parters of wool, forcers, thickers, dressers, walkers, dyers, butlers, shearers, pressers, edgers, liners, and band makers band makers. Unfortunately, we don't know what all of those things are, so I'm not going to be able to recreate every single step in the process. But I know a lot of those. I should be able to do a good sum of them. And we're starting with some washed sheep, so we'll start with the carding and go from there. And to help with this process, I found the Knitting in Early Modern Europe project, which is really cool. They have taken I think 68 of the 100 surviving caps from archaeological contexts and collected a whole bunch of data for them that is available on their website. And I'm going to be using these data to help make decisions in the recreation process. And of the different types of caps, I am planning on recreating a split, brim split brimmed cap because it's it's looks like the most difficult. <laughs> The other caps, I can kind of look at what they look like and I can sort of see how the brim should be made. The single brim cap looks to me like you could just knit the whole thing in one piece, cast down at the center of the top, knit outwards, knit back in for where you put a band around the crown, and then knit outwards, flip it around and knit back in and secure on the inside to make the double knitted brim. The split brim cap is interesting because it's not like you can knit a single brim cap and then cut the brim for the split because the edges of the split overlap by quite a bit. So I'm going to have to do more thinking and more experimenting to see how that's achieved rather than just 
picking the option where I can pretty sure I can just see how it was done. So come back next week as we get started with the carding process and talk a little bit about historical wool preparation and carding versus combing.